Okay, so this is uh, lecture 11. Uh, we're going to do equivalence classes and modular arithmetic. I'll remind you where we got to last time. We were talking about partitions, and we'd looked a bit at partitions of a set with four elements and partitions of a set with three elements. Uh, the sort of picture we had... We had your set S, which last time maybe just had a few things in it. Maybe 1, 3, 7, and 10. And then we looked at various ways you could chop your set up by putting maybe two of the elements in one. Uh, you could put two in one bit and one in another bit and so on. Um, this was one of the ways to partition S up into three pieces, where two of the pieces had only one element in and the last piece had two elements in. So that was, a sort of, that was an example of a partition of a set. And then we had the actual definition. It was a set of sets. It was a collection of subsets of S, and you had to satisfy various things. But the idea was that every element of X was in exactly one of these sets, which you can see we've managed here. If you look at the elements of S, each element of S, each of the four elements of S is in exactly one of these three uh, sets that I'm showing here. Um, and you, but you have to partition into non-empty sets, so otherwise you could throw in the empty set as often as you liked, but it wouldn't be relevant. So you can partition into non-empty sets as well. Uh, so you need these three things. You've got a collection of subsets of your set, and each of the sets in your collection has to be non-empty. They mustn't overlap. As you can see, the three pieces I used here, um, they've got no elements in common with each other, so that's okay. And the union has to be the whole thing. So it all comes out to mean that every element of your set is in exactly one of the things in the partition. Now, we've seen some examples of this. Um, we saw how to partition the integers into the odd integers and the even integers. So we had z equals O union E, where O is a set of odd integers. E is a set of even integers. Um, so, the partition you get corresponding to that, the collection, that means chopping then into two pieces. So, I've got a set with two elements, and the two elements themselves are sets. One of them is O, the other one's E. So, C, the collection of sets, is the partition, and the partition has got two things in it here. One is the set of odd integers, and the other is the set of even integers. And those two subsets of Z partition Z into these two pieces. Okay, now that's a special case of what happens for an equivalence relation. Equivalence relations always partition sets up into pieces, but sometimes there's infinitely many pieces. Still, let's not go that far yet. Let's have a look at congruence modulo k. Now, I think I'm going to have to remind you of a couple of things here. So let's get let's make myself another piece of paper. I'm going to have to write a bit more. Okay. So congruence modulo k. So k is a positive integer, and congruence modulo k uh, goes like this. It's, uh, so you fix for the moment k, a positive integer that we're going to work with, maybe k equals 9 or 10 or 11. We're going to say a bit later about the special cases where you're 9, 10 or 11. Um, when you do even integers and odd integers, that's the case where k equals 2. 
So we already did k equals 2. That gives you even integers and odd integers. Um, and you say m is congruent to n mod k. That's the same as saying k goes into m minus n. m minus n is divisible by k, which is the same as saying they've got the same remainder. So that's if and only if m and n leave same remainder when divided by k. Uh, this is why when k equals 2, um, you get odd integers leave remainder 1 and even integers leave remainder 0. That's when divided by 2. Uh, so k equals 2, you get odd integers and even integers. When k equals 10, so if you're looking at dividing by 10, then basically what you do is you look at the last digit, except that when you go negative, it changes. Okay. That's 3, 13, 23, 33. They all have the same remainder when divided by 10. But when you go negative, you have to use things like minus 7. Minus 7 and 3 both leave remainder 3 when you divide by 10. Um, so you have to remember what happens with the negative integers. Uh, but it's a, this module is actually not a very hard concept once you get used to it. And it's quite fun to play with. And we'll play with it a bit at the end of the lecture. But first we're going to do some more abstract stuff. Okay, so if you do congruence modulo k, where k will be some integer or other that we happen to be interested in at the moment, we'll vary k later. For the moment you should say uh, k is going to be fixed temporarily while we talk about congruence modulo k. So we're now using an equivalence relation. So we get an equivalence relation... And you could use the typical equivalence relation notation with this uh, uh, sort of wriggly line symbol, which some people call twiddles, um, whatever you want to call it. Um, anyway, M is related to N at the moment. Currently means... that k divides into m minus n, okay? So m minus n should be divisible by k. That's what m related to n means at the moment. That's our current equivalent relation. Um, it's the same as, uh, so it means that we're currently working with this relation, that m should be congruent to n modulo k. When you do that, you get equivalence classes. Now, we didn't have much time to talk about this before, so I'd probably better remind you what this means. Um, if you put square brackets around something, it means the set of things that are related to that thing. So, so the equivalence class of N, that square bracket around N means the equivalence class of N. So it's not an equivalence relation, it's an equivalence class of N is it's a notation for this thing. It's those integers at the moment, those M in Z so that N is related to M. Which is the same thing since the relationship at the moment is congruent modulo K that's the same thing as those m, so that m is congruent to n modulo k, which is the same as saying those m 
Oh, I see. I've swapped M and N round, but it doesn't matter because it is symmetric. So it doesn't really matter whether you say M related to N or N related to M here because we already know it's an equivalence relation. And equivalence relations are symmetric, so it means the same thing either way around. So it's those things where M minus N, or N minus M, is divisible by K. Uh, so the congruence class of naught, that's the equivalence class of naught, that's those things which are congruent to naught modulo K. That's the things that leave remainder zero when you divide by K, which just means those things which are divisible by K. So, so the zero, uh, the square brackets around naught is a very special one. These are the things that are actually multiples of K. Square brackets around one are multiples of K, but add one. So multiples of K plus, and then you add one to it. And the same, all the way, you can look the same up to K minus one. So these are the ones where you, do, you multiply K by some integer and then add K minus one. So an easier way of thinking about that might be to multiply k by some other integer and subtract 1. Um, and that gives you the same set of things. So k minus 1 is, rather the, is actually the same as minus 1 when you're working modulo k. So it's quite often easier to work with minus 1 than it is to work with k minus 1. Now, I claim this is a partition of the integers. Um, and this is really from our quotient to remainder fact. So what happens? If you take an integer n and you divide by k, log division, you'll get some remainder. And this is what you always get with quotient to remainder. n equals qk plus r. So what are you doing? You've got your integer n. Let's assume everything's positive to make this make more sense. Then you divide it by k. And you see how many times it goes. But you don't work out a decimal expansion. You find, you work out your, the integer, the bigger, you know, the integer you can get when you divide by k, and then there will be a remainder r. And that r will be between 0 and k minus 1, because that's how remainders work when you divide uh, by an integer. Um, if n is negative, it's slightly more complicated to think about, but it still works and you still end up with a remainder that's between 0 and k minus 1, if you do it the official way. Um, so here's your remainder. It's one of these numbers, 0, 1 up to k minus 1. And then when you look at divisibility by k, well, qk is a multiple of k. So you get that n, if you do n minus r, n minus r is q times k. So if I, let's if I do that. Uh, n minus r equals q times k, which tells you that m minus r is divisible by k, which means that n is congruent to r and r is congruent to n, modulo k. So that's why you discover that, well, n is congruent to r modulo k, and the same the other way around, and then with a little bit of work, um, what you discover is that they actually have the same congruence class, the same equivalence class. So in theory, what you would do is you'd look for every integer n, you look at all the integers n, and find out what's their, uh, what's their equivalence class. But they all repeat, because any integer n you try will be congruent to one of these numbers between 0 and k minus 1, and then you get the same equivalence class. So by the time you've listed the things equivalent to 0, the things equivalent to 1, and so on, the things equivalent to k minus 1, you've actually listed all the different equivalence classes. Now, there's going to be a, a few more abstract details coming later that might help you just check some of these. But what this says is, if you do con equivalence modulo k, you will get exactly k different equivalence classes. Now, when we did k equals 2, you got two equivalence classes, which were the odd integers and the even integers. If you looked at any other integer and looked at what's equivalent to it, you would have got one of those two. Because if you start with any odd integer, all other odd integers are equivalent to it, um, if you modulo 2. Subtract any odd integer from any other odd integer, you'll still get an even number. So they're all equivalent to each other. Um, and the same for uh, 
the even ones are all equivalent to each other as well and give the same class. So you can, you can get lots of repeats, but they're still the same two equivalence classes coming over and over again if you're doing modulo 2. If you're doing congruence modulo 10, so if k is 10, then what you get here is the class of 0, the class of 1, and so on up to the class of 9, which is basically talking about the last digit. Okay? So if you're doing congruence modulo 10, you're really talking about last digit, except that the negative ones, you get messed up a bit, and you have to subtract from 10, um, because minus 3 is in the congruence class of 7, modulo 10, the equivalent class of 7. But the positive integers, or 0, they're exactly where you think they're going to be. You just look at the last digit, and that's what you get modulo 10. So there's 10 different classes modulo 10, there's two different classes modulo 2, and there's k different classes modulo k, whatever k you try. Uh, a reminder that repeats in a set don't change the set. So suppose instead of just, suppose I was looking at these two different versions of my collection C, this is supposed to be, again, think K or 10 if you like, so that we're talking about the things with last digit 0, 1, or so on, up to last digit 9. These ones are all different from each other. Um, but you're also allowed to write C as a set of all equivalent classes of everything. That's got loads of repeats in, because if you take N equals 9, you'll get the same equiv equivalence class if you take N equals 19. Um, so you get... Each of these things will be listed infinitely often. And the same for minus 1. Minus 1, 9, 19. Look at any of those as n. They'll give you actually the same equivalence class. So you get lots of repeats. And so in fact, these two c's are actually equal to each other, but they're just written in different ways. Uh, one of them, I've made sure each equivalence class is only mentioned once each. And the other one, every equivalence class is actually mentioned infinitely often each. But it's the same set of possible classes. So that's okay as well. Right, now we're going to see it happens the same way for all equivalence relations. So now we go to the abstract and we get a bit of theory. You take an equivalence relation, twiddles or whatever you want to call that wriggly line, on a non-empty set S. And uh, let me remind you again what the equivalence class of X is. You put square brackets around X and it's not X anymore, it's now a set. It's a subset of S, and it's this subset of S. Um, now, sometimes we're going to clash. It isn't always good to use Y. In the lemma below, Y is going to be in use, so we can't use Y there, so you might need another letter. So you can use... It's a dummy variable, Y in there, so we can change Y to anything we like. It's equal to Z in S. Such that, Z, uh, such that X is related to Z. It's the same as, or you can use a W, which I do down here. W and S, so that X is related to W. Also, equivalence relations are symmetric. So X is related to W if and only if W is related to X. It's an equivalence relation. Equivalence relations are reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. So in particular, they're symmetric... Um, symmetry of this equivalence relation we're working with at the moment gives X is related to W if and only if W is related to X. So it doesn't matter whether I write X related to W or W related to X when we're working with a symmetric relation and certainly when we're working with an equivalence relation. Okay, so that's just the notation out of the way. And how does this fit with what we're doing before? Well, it's exactly what I said before. If it was, if it was congruence modulo 2, then we're talking about they're both odd, or they're both even, as being, that's the equivalence relation. If it's congruence modulo 10, then it's like same last digit, um, except for the negative bits, um, where, you go the other, where you do something different. Um, And now here's the lemma. Uh, so you take an equivalence relation on a non-empty set S, and now you take X and Y in S, and I want to say some things about these different classes. I'm going to, eventually I want to claim that you get a partition of S, and I need this lemma to get me started. So first of all, um, 
When you do a partition, the things in the partition have to be non-empty. There should be at least one thing in each figure of the partition. And the things in my partition are supposed to be the equivalence classes. So we get ourselves started by noting that x is in the equivalence class of x. Um, and that's because x is related to x. That's because it's a reflexive relation. Um, reflexive relations are the ones where x is related to x for all x. So we always have x in, the equivalence in, in its own equivalence class here using reflexivity of the relation. Um, so in particular, these equivalence classes are non-empty, which is a good start. Okay, and then there are these three equivalent statements, each of which implies the other two. And uh, I want to show you how, the, how you get a good, efficient proof structure to show that three different statements are equivalent. You've seen how to do that two statements are equivalent, each one implies the other, but what's the best way to show that three statements are equivalent? Well, I'll, I'll give you various possible strategies, and you never know which one is going to be the most efficient strategy for your current result. Okay, so the first statement, these three are supposed to each imply the other two. As it says, each one implies both of the others. And we're going to have to somehow prove that all of them imply each of the others. One is that x is related to y by this equivalence relation. The second one is that the equivalence class of x has non-empty intersection with the equivalence class of y. That just says that there should be at least one point that's in both equivalence classes. So there's something that's equivalent to x and something that's equivalent to y. That one's the fact that uh, uh, we're going to get that using transitivity. The last one is a rather stronger statement that says that the equivalence class of X and the equivalence class of Y is actually exactly the same. Um, so these three things obviously got some connection to each other. We're going to show each one implies the others. Now, in theory, so here's some comments before we prove this. Um, we want that A is true if and only if B is true, B is true if and only if C is true, and that A is true if and only if C is true. But you don't have to, that would be six implications and that would be much too much, that would be overkill. Because If you can show that A and B are equivalent and that B and C are equivalent, it follows that A and C are equivalent. So, fortunately, you never have to show six. Okay? Sometimes it's worth showing four. It turns out sometimes, and, but you can also do it with three, as I'll show you. So, if we show A if and only if B and B if and only if C, we're still on comments at the moment, We've, uh, we automatically get A if and only if C for free. Because if, if you've got the other two, then if A is true, then it follows that B is true, and then because B is true, it follows that C is true. So from A you can get to C, and back again. If you know C is true, then B would follow, and then from B you'd get A. So you don't have to show separately the A if and only if C. So that's one way to do it. Um, but you can do it with three implications or if we can show that A implies B and B implies C and C implies A, separately of course. You have to keep starting again, right? You start by assuming A and then you prove B, and then you forget everything because you don't know anything anymore. Then you assume B, and you don't assume A anymore, but you, you show that if you assume B, then you get C. Then you forget everything again, and you start again, and you say, we don't assume A or B, let's assume C is true, and see if we can deduce A is true. Once you've done that, if you've got A implies B is true, and B implies C is true, and C implies A is true, you get all the rest for free. Why is that? Well, 
Suppose you wanted to show that B implies A, because that's missing from our list. So you suppose that B is true. Suppose we know these three, and you know that B is true. Well, we've got B implies C, so then C will be true. And we've got C implies A, so A will be true. So if we've got these three, and we know B is true, it will force A to be true, and that will give us B implies A for free from these three. And the same for the other three as well. So you can do it with just three. Now, this is the structure I followed last year, and it didn't work out very well, because it turns out to be slightly easier to either do A if and only if B and B and only if C, to do those four implications, was actually quicker than to do these three implications. And there's another one that's quicker as well, because it turns out to be fairly quick to just do it the other way around, which is to do C implies A. Um, sorry, which, what, what am I doing? C implies B. B implies A. And A implies C. And if I prove those three, the rest come for free as well. So I think I'm going to, they all work. Some of them take longer than others. I'm going to do the third one this year. So we'll do this one this year. I can't remember which I did two years ago. Last year I did the middle one and it took a bit longer than I liked. So I won't do it that way this year. Uh, right. We do have to prove this first bit. Uh, I've already said it, but I have to remember to write it down. So we're now going to prove this lever. Uh, note, x and y are fixed, they're not available as dummy variables. x and y are fixed in the whole lemma. They don't change in this lemma. So x and y are in S, and I'm not allowed to use them as a dummy variable, which means I'm not going to be allowed to write this, y in S, so that x is related to y. Because y is a dummy variable here. I mustn't use that one. I can use Z, I can use W, but I can't use y. Unless I'm using the particular y that we fixed in the lemma. So, warding. X and Y are in use. So, we'll use Z and W as our dummy variables. Uh, I asked for most of this lemma, the, I asked for the proof of most of this lemma two years ago. Um, and people, uh, people got into notational tangle using X and Y as, uh, where they couldn't. People used Y as a dummy variable and then it got very messy. And so if you were asked to prove this, don't do that. Um, so the first claim, the first claim we have to remember at the top of the lemma is that X is in its own equivalence class. Um, but this is because twiddle is reflexive. So we have x is related to x, which is exactly the same as saying that the second x is in the equivalence class of the first x. Okay, they're both x. So if we look back at the definition of equivalence class, the equivalence class of X is anything that's related to X. In particular, X is related to X. So X is in the equivalence class of X by definition. Okay, that's the first bit. Okay, now I'm going to do C implies B implies 
I'm going to do C implies B, then B implies A, and then A implies C separately. And that forces you, remember, you have to keep starting again. Once I've proven C implies B, I then have to forget that I ever believed C was true, and then assume that B is true in order to get A from B, and then forget that I ever believed that B was true, and only assume A in order to deduce C. So C is that the equivalent class is equal, and B is they've got on empty intersection. So we'll suppose C is true, and uh, let me make sure I've got this in front of me. Because so. the statement's about to disappear off the top. Yeah, okay. Now, it's important to tell the, the reader which bit you're doing. So I will write C implies B here. Suppose that C is true. I.e. C being true says that they're the same exactly. The same set of things equivalent to both. Okay? Related to both. Uh, but this is a particularly easy case. If two sets are equal, then their intersection is the same as either one of them. They're sets, remember? So I intersect these sets, and what do I get? Um, when sets are equal, their intersection is the same as either one of them. But we already know that the equivalence class of X is not empty by above. Um, remember X. We don't have to say it again, but you'll, I'll remind you that X is in its own equivalence class. So it's certainly not empty. So B follows. B is just, B is the one that says that they've got non-empty intersection. Okay, now you have to forget whether you ever believed C or B held and decide what you're going to do next. Now we're going to prove that B implies A. So now we don't know whether C holds at the moment, but we do assume that B holds. So suppose that B holds. Which, I'll remind you, says that the intersection is non-empty. Uh, intersection non-empty means there exists at least one W in there. So I'll use W this time. Uh, a set being non-empty means there's something in there. Okay? Now, we have to use the definition now. Um, w is in the equivalence class of X, so that means that X is X triddles W. And W is in the equivalence class of Y means that Y triddles W. So, by definition, of um, these equivalence classes, we have X is related to W and Y related to W for this same W. Okay? This W that's in both equivalent classes will have X related to W and Y is related to W. Now our target, A, is to show that X is related to Y. And we get this by using symmetry and transitivity. So by symmetry, W is related to Y. And now transitivity, since X is related to W and W is related to Y, X is related to Y. And so A holds.
Um, that completes the proofs that B implies A. And now we have to forget everything again. And now we have to prove that A implies C. We've shown that if C is true, B is true. We've shown that if B is true, A is true. Now we've got to show that if A is true, then C is true. So now we suppose that A that A holds <coughs> i.e. x is related to y. And our task is to show that they've got exactly the same equivalence class. Our target, not yet proven, is to prove C that they have the same equivalence class. That's our target, okay? But we haven't proven it yet. It's always dangerous to write down the thing you're trying to prove because you might believe you've proven it and start making deductions from it and then end up proving it implies itself. But here I think it's a good idea to bear in mind what we're trying to do, what we do is we show that each one's a subset of the other. They're sets. So, let's let uh, for uh, they're the same both ways round. So for for the equivalent class of X containing the equivalent class of Y, we let W be in the equivalent class of X. And we have to show that it's all, that forces it to be the equivalent class of Y. That means that X is related to W. That's the definition of the equivalent class of X. It's a set of those W so that X is related to W. Okay, so I've used the definition of the equivalent class of X. But... X is related to Y, so we also have Y is related to X by symmetry. And then Y related to X and X related to W gives Y related to W by transitivity. So, Y is related to W means W is in the equivalence class of Y, by definition. Whenever W is in the equivalence class of X, then W is in the equivalence class of Y. So this shows that the whole of the equivalent class of X is contained in the equivalent class of Y. But uh, it's the same the other way around. <coughs> same proof since Y is also related to X the other way around. So we can stop there. Okay, and we've proven three statements of equivalent. Still came out quite long but not quite as long as last year. Okay, now, you're welcome to look for alternative proofs of that, and uh, you can shorten it slightly, but that's, but that's basically it. Right, any questions about that long proof?
Right, let's move on to something. We've essentially proved this theorem. Oh, have we, have we got questions? As, uh, we haven't got that much time, so we should uh, carry on. Okay, uh, so you've got an equivalence relation, and I said the set of equivalence classes partitions S, and we've effectively proved it. Everything in C has to be in exactly one of these equivalence classes, and they must be non-empty. So this follows from the lemma, Um, remember, X is always in its own equivalence class, which gives you that the equivalence class are non-empty, but also that everything's in at least one of the equivalence classes. And we know that they don't overlap unless they're equal. So if you're worried about overlaps, well, the only, way, the only reason you get some overlaps is because you've got two of these classes which are the same as each other. But that doesn't matter for a partition because repeats only count once. So for any equivalence relation you like, you always get, uh, uh, you always get a partition this way. Okay, let's move on to some more fun stuff. Oh, okay, this is, uh, here's some easy examples, actually, that I, well, that I should mention first. Um, here are two different partitions of Z. They may look slightly similar, but it's a bit like what we had last time. This is the one for the equality relation, where the equivalence classes for the equality relation have got one point in each. Um, remember, this is... X is related to Y if and only if X equals Y. So it's very easy to work out the equivalence relations. The equivalence relation of X has only got X in and nothing else. So when you use that on Z, the equivalence class has got one point in each. But you get infinitely many equivalence classes. On the other hand, if you use a trivial relation... That's where for all x, y, we have x is related to y. Then everything's related to everything else, and you only get one big equivalence class, which is z. And so this partition is a rather boring partition where you only have one, uh, where you throw every element into one set and say, that's a partition of my set. It's not a very exciting one but it's a partition. So those are the two extreme, uh, two extreme equivalence relations and two extreme partitions for Z. Okay, now, let me introduce you to modular arithmetic. Uh, we already know that sum of two even numbers is even, the sum of two odd numbers is even, and if you add an odd number to an even number, you get an odd number. If you work in modulo 2, you've got two possible remainders, 0 and 1. And you get a sort of addition and multiplication table, where you think of 0 plus 0 is 0. That's saying an even number plus an even number is an even number. 1 plus 1 is 0. It's like saying an odd number plus an odd number is an even number. And so on. And if you multiply an even number by anything, you get an even number, which is like saying 0 times anything is 0. And 1 times 1 equals 1, that's an odd number times an odd number is an odd number. So in disguise, these statements in the modular 2 world tell you something about odd numbers and even numbers. And uh, I think I'm going to leave this proof out this year. What this says is that 
you can work with modular arithmetic and with the uh, usual, uh, you can work with arithmetic in the usual way alongside modular arithmetic. So suppose you start by knowing that A1 and A2 leaves the same remainder when you divide by K and that B1 and B2 leave the same remainder when you divide by K. Then you can prove that A1 plus B1 leaves the same remainder as A2 plus B2 when you divide by K. It's quite easy, actually. I'll probably, uh, I'll make this proof available, but it's not going to be examinable. Um, but I want to make sure you know what's being said here. The same, um, if you know that A1 and A2 leave the same remainder when you divide by K, and that B1 and B2 leave the same remainder when you divide by K, then it's also true that if you multiply A1 by B1 and divide by K, you get the same remainder as when you multiply A2 by B2. What this means is that you can, all, you can change any integer you like into any other integer you like when you're working modulo K, as long as you're talking about addition and multiplication. Uh, so I'll make this proof uh, will be made available. Okay, I'll make this proof available, but it won't be examinable as book work. Okay. So I will let I will make that proof available so you all know why it's true but it means that I won't ask you to prove that on the exam, okay? Now I want to show you how useful this is. For example, suppose you're dividing by 11. Well, 10 and minus 1 are congruent modulo 11 because their difference is divisible by 11. And whenever you look at a power of 10 and try and figure out what its remainder is, module 11, you can pretend that 10 is minus 1 to get you started. 100 is 10 times 10. Now, in fact, you could just say 100 is 99 plus 1, which tells you that you're going to get remainder 1. Or you can think of it as minus 1 times minus 1, which will give you 1, module 11. And more generally, if you take any power of 10, the remainders will alternate well. It's going to be minus 1 to the n mod 11, which means, officially, the remainders mod 11 will alternate between um, 10 and 1. Or, well, indeed, if you take 10 to the naught, you get remainder 1. 10 to the 1, you get remainder 10. 10 squared, you get remainder 1. 10 cubed, you get remainder 10. And now, if you're doing 357, that's 3 lots of 100, 5 lots of 10, and 7 lots of 1. But 100 is the same as 1. So 300 can be replaced as 3 times 1. 5 tens, 10 is the same as minus 1. So I could do 3 times 1 plus 5 times minus 1 plus 7 times 1, and you discover that it's 5 modulo 11. So what you do there is I need a plus 7 minus 5 plus 3. That's 10 minus 5 is 5. And you can work out the remainder modulo 11 just by combining the digits this way. And now modulo 9... 1, 10, 100, 1,000, they all leave remainder 1, modulo 9. So you can treat any power of 10 as if it's 1 when you're working modulo 9. So if you look at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's the same as 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 when you're working modulo 9. You know the remainder is going to be the same as the remainder you get from 6. So in particular, it's not divisible by 9. And... Uh, it's a pity we haven't got time to think about this question, um, but it's a, it's a cautionary tale, this one. Um, you're not allowed to do it to the power. Um, addition is okay, multiplication is okay, and once you've said that 10 is the same as 1, you can take powers of 1 instead of powers of 10, but I can't say... Uh, oh, actually, sorry, this is module 11. So once we've said that 10 is the same as minus 1, we could work with powers of minus 1 just as well as we can work powers of 10. Um, but what we mustn't do is change the 22 into an 11 or a 0 or a 33. Um, that doesn't work. Um, you're not allowed to change the power. Um, so what you could do 
I suggest you think about this one for a bit, um, and uh, I will post the answer to this question, give you a chance to think about it, and then you'll see if you've got the answer right. So uh, you can even vote on it after, uh, sometime after the class, and I'll see what your vote was. Okay?